Yeah, thank you. <laughs> uh, yes, as, as you've heard, and you've also heard a bit from Eric during uh, his talk, I will be talking about short-range orientation, and particularly in my model organisms, the dung beetles. And um, I started working with them, these uh, beetles already when I was a PhD student, and now, almost 20 years later, it's one of the model animals, I think, or the model animal where we know of most visually mediated compass cues that they use for their compass. Or at least this is what I want to claim in a research proposal I'm submitting on Monday. <laughs> uh, and I thought that actually having this audience here was actually the best opportunity for me to find out if this is actually true. Uh, since I only have a week left to finish this proposal. So, so I actually challenge you to dare this uh, concept, you know, to challenge this concept towards the end of the day, after you've heard the story about the dung beetles, and see if I can really claim that they are the single model animals where we have shown most visual compass cues that are integrated in their compass. Uh, but first of all, we leave the stage to these uh, wonderful little creatures, the ball-rolling dung beetles. And they, in their life, they roll their dung ball across the savannah, or in forests, or, or in cities even, along straight paths. They go straight over obstacles, they never go around them. They are so set to go in this particular direction that they will keep their bearing at all costs. And of course, Eric has hinted why they do this. And if you have a dung pad in the center, you will see these animals moving out from this dung pile in straight paths in all possible directions. The reason that they do that is to get away from the dung pad. So if you imagine, for example, that this here is the dung pile, the beetles will fly in and they will then form their dung balls. That is the lunch that they will be feeding on for the next couple of days, and that ball they want to keep at all costs. And the best way to do that is to get away from the dung pile. Because, attracted by the sense of smell of the pile, there will be other beetles flying in. These beetles are warm because they have just flown, and thereby they're also fast. So these beetles that will come there to the dung pad preferentially, Fine beetles with balls can now choose if they want to make a ball of their own or simply just steal somebody <laughs> else's. So, rolling straight is the best strategy to keep your dung ball. Because if you move straight away from the dung pad, you maximize the distance between you and the dung pad with every step, and you also make 100% sure you never ever return to that place again. Also, they move straight and they move away, trying to locate the perfect place to dig down their ball. They don't know this when they leave the dung pad. They would just find it, sense that they are there, and then start digging down their ball. And they want to do this as quickly as possible, because it's dangerous being on top of the soil. Here, there are lots of predators, like this solifugid, that actually stole one of our experimental animals one night. And also monkeys and birds will try to eat these animals. So they do their best to move in a straight line. And the minute you give them a dung ball, they will start to move in a straight line. So from the perspective of studying orientation, it's a very, very efficient system. You take a beetle, you take a ball, you put them together, and they use their compass. So I have been looking at what cues these animals can use for their orientation system. And we can go back to Eric's lecture and go through the different, actually, categories of cues that animals can use for orientation. So one of them is internal cues. And this is actually a cue that is very difficult for animals to use for orientation over longer distances. Most animals can use it up to 50 centimeters, and the, the beetles we move over much longer distances than that. So they can't rely on internal cues alone. We were studying the orientation system on a hockey pitch in Johannesburg, because sometimes we want really flat ground over long distances. In the middle of the day, it was too hot for us to work with them, because the dung actually melted into this plastic surface. So we decided to, instead of tracking the beetle, we decided to track ourselves with this GPS system. And 
But Basile is doing, a former postdoc of mine, he's asked to move backwards in a straight line. He can only use internal cues because he can't see anything and he can't hear anything. He's got Iron Maiden in his headphones. <laughs> and as you quickly see here, he is definitely not moving in a straight line. We can't move straight either based on idothetic cues and neither can most animals. And you see him, he is actually convinced now, because I've done this myself, it feels like you're moving in a straight line. But as you will see when we actually <laughs> stop him from doing that, <laughs> he's really surprised because he thought he was way off in the other end of this, uh, <laughs> of this place. And if we put him on a beetle scale, he actually never really got away from the dung part. And to be honest, I was actually even worse. I really circled when doing this. So the beetles, as far as we can tell, because if we let them roll in the dark, as you will see on Lana's poster, what I do, they will also circle. So internal cues is definitely not, not enough for them to orient by. Then we have local external cues. That was the next one on, on Eric's list. And um, there's maybe other one to add yeah. to here that kind of in addition to this, they are also being a subject in one of his experiments. And, uh, uh, but besides the experimental evidence, we cannot use pure geophetic like cues to keep on straight lines. There's this beautiful uh, theoretical study by uh, Alan Chung yes. called yeah. The Difficulty of Moving on a Straight, in a straight Line. That's yes. the start of the paper. Yeah. It shows mathematically that it's just impossible <coughs> to do this. If you, yeah, but even the smallest amount of error in your step counting, in your directional counting, you very quickly start going in circles. Yep. It's a mathematical, a mathematical impossibility to keep a step on that yep. mm -hmm. Yes? Has this uh, maybe something to do about humans uh, with the fact that we are lateralized and therefore uh, also our motor system is lateralized, so we use uh, uh, more efficiently one leg than, and, and one arm or one side and, and the other one. So when we walk, uh, if we don't take a reference, a visual reference on something, we, it's very likely that we turn on the side of the... Yeah. Interesting enough, we don't always rotate in the same direction. So if I did this on the next day, I could actually end up rotating in the other direction. Yeah. yeah. But that, yeah, that is true. So external cues, which could, for example, be landmarks, could be used by the beetles. They could, ex for example, be moving away from the dung pad in a straight line by keeping the dung pad aligned with, for example, another external cue. And then by keeping that line, they could move backwards. We don't think that that is what they do. We have moved the dung pad around. They don't react to that at all. And also, if we release them on an overcast, under an overcast sky, when they can't use any celestial cues, they are actually moving around in circles. They can no longer orient. So we don't think that this compass system is relying on landmarks at all, which is very unusual for a compass system to not do that. Yes? Sorry, uh, was the reason they do the task upside down? They do they, what upside they down? They, they, I mean, they can just push the, the ball. Oh, okay, yes. <coughs> Yeah, yeah, that, that is how a, a dung beetle rolls, so to say. <laughs> they, all of them rolls. Uh, there are some exceptions that will actually push it, but the big majority do that because they get the best force out, out of, of their body in that way. Yeah. Which, of course, creates problems because now your head is down <laughs> by the ground. Yeah. So many animals, including the dung beetles, will instead rely on external cues that can guide you for an extended amount of time and distance over the surface of the ground. You can rely on mechanical cues like the wind, for example, that many animals are known to do. Magnetic cues, we don't think they use magnetic cues for the same reason as you saw before, that actually on an overcast day they will not move in a straight line. And as far as I understand magnetic compass orientation, they would still be able to do that if they used that. So we have celestial cues, which is where the dung beetles really master the field, so to say. And how do we know that the animals are using celestial cues? Well, we started with a fairly simple, it seems simple to put a hat on a dung beetle, but believe me, it's really difficult. <laughs> 
Eric was actually the best skilled person in making hats for the beetles, but they don't really want to keep them on. So that is a challenge. Whatever you want to attach to a beetle, you have a challenge because they live in an environment that is really dirty. So their whole surface of the body is made to keep them clean. So you can't, it's really hard to stick something to them. But when you manage to fit a hat on a beetle, this is what will happen. This is a little beetle now, and it's rolling out. The air, uh, arena you see is only 50 centimeters across. So it's really, really short. You only have to move 25 centimeters to get away from a um, border board, so to say. But wearing a hat, the beetle is now completely lost. The compass does not work at all anymore. And if we instead put a transparent cap to these animals, they will navigate in nice and straight lines. The problem here is that it prevents them effectively from seeing the cues in the sky and thereby their compass is set out of play. Yes? Um, is there any evidence that they like, keep track of how confident they are that they can manage the task? I mean, you would think that maybe if, since they completely fail, why would they even try on an overcast day or... It's it's interesting because the beetles would do their best to roll in complete darkness on completely overcast weather and they will continue rolling for as long even if they don't roll in a straight line. Is this what you meant? Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes? Well even even a even a random walk will be better than not moving at all mm. if you want mm. to get Done. Because they are, you have to admit, they are not trying to get to a specific home. Yeah, so any movement that will take them away is probably better than just sitting there and having your, your ball stolen. Yes? With this hat, uh, are you sure that they don't they block only the celestial view or also like far visual cues? As you will see later, they, they, would, they have four eyes. So they, have, they, they look upwards, they look downwards, and they look sidewards. And with the hat, we are blocking the dorsal visual field. So they, are not, they will still see down and to the sides. OK, so what cues could there then be in the sky that these <coughs> animals are actually using? You have heard about all of them in the lecture before mine. And now we will just go through them one by one and see what the beetles can actually use. Um, Sanchi made a beautiful demonstration of ants using the sun as a compass cue. And I would dare to say it's actually more elegant than that in a dung beetle. Because as you will see, the dung beetles are perfect organisms for looking at sun compasses. What we do here is we let the beetle roll and then we will now reflect the sun from the other side, shade it at the same time, the real sun, and immediately the beetle changes direction by 180 degrees. And then we can give it the real sun again, and it's now going to change its direction again. And we can continue doing this for a very, very long time, and the beetle will just keep on rolling back and forth in front of us. And this is a very, very... Uh, elegant demonstration of an animal that is using a sun compass. These beetles are so simple to work with because they don't move very fast, <laughs> they don't bite actually, and they are totally ignorant to us being close to them. They don't react at all to the experimenters running around them. Another way of looking at how, looking at the compass system of these animals, that is a method we are using a lot, where we can actually better quantify what they're doing, is to use uh, circular arenas like these. And we can put the beetle in the center. When it's been given its ball, it's now going to try to move in a straight line, as straight as it can. When it reaches the rim of the arena, we can, for example, record its uh, bearing. We can then put it in again, take it off its ball. For, from the perspective of the animal, this is no worse than actually just falling down a hole and trying to get hold of its ball again. So it will then keep its direction again, and we can record the bearing, and we can actually put the beetle back in the center like a hundred times. It will just keep on rolling in the same direction. Or we can manipulate the animal now again with a mirror, and we can look and quantify the response of the animal to this treatment. And then we can also film 
the parts of these animals and look at how straight they are also as a measure of orientation performance. And of course now we can measure the difference between the, the exits here and that way we can quantify how precise the compass system is. And we can compare this in day active animals and night active animals. And we then find that the nocturnal compass works with the same precision as a day compass. And this is a visual, yes? Do I understand correctly that every individual has his own compass which is certain degrees to the light and this is spread across the population of dung beetles and they just go then in 260 degrees? Yeah. Is it inheritable, this? The, what, which compass direction they pick is something we do not understand, why they pick that particular direction. And they keep it all lifelong? They do not keep it all lifelong. That would make my life extremely simple, because I would know where they would go whenever I had a beetle. No, they pick a new direction whenever they make a ball. So they make a ball and then they seemingly randomly pick a direction that they will keep for as long as they get to keep their ball. And when asked to make a new ball, they then keep take a new direction. Hmm? It's actually not a bad strategy because in addition to keeping in a straight line or so getting away from the dust pile, which is dangerous uh, for obvious reasons you, you, you mentioned, you also want them to be spread randomly, not to compete with each other. So just picking yeah. a random direction is yeah, but it would work in the same manner if, if they had a direction yeah. that was inherited right. but it was randomly kind of given to you at birth, so to say. But that is not uh, what they do. Yes? Uh, but that means that there's some, some form of decision making or? Yeah. Mm. That we have tried to understand for 10 years but <laughs> still don't understand how that happens. Yeah, it's kind of like a roulette table and then one of them is picked. Um, okay, so we know then that they can use the sun for their <coughs> orientation and uh, we can measure this uh, outside. So here, for example, is one animal that has rolled three times. We can get a mean direction. And the interesting with these animals is that we can then take this very beetle and we move it into our lab. So now it's going from the sun-drenched outdoors in Africa into a dark room with the only thing given to them is a green LED as a replacement of the sun. And this is now the same animal that will now keep the same direction in relationship to the green LED as it did in relationship to the sun. So we know that when we work with them in the lab where we use a green LED instead of a sun, we know that this is also in the in the system of the beetles, a fair replacement for a sun. <coughs> but for the beetle, that's the same event of fall making. Yeah. Okay. yeah. So that's on the same day of this world? Oh, it's basically the beetle rolls three times out there. We pick it up, we walk into our lab we have yeah, in South Africa, put the beetle down with a green LED, and this is what it does. Hmm? Uh, why green? Because the side of the sky where the sun is is richer in green than in UV. So many animals will interpret green as the sun direction and UV as the anti-sun direction. Actually, as you will see, we could have used any colored LED for the beetles because they don't work like that. Yeah. Hmm? Okay. So we can use the same technique, of course, to test if they're using the moon. We can also reflect the moon using a mirror, and we will see that they can also use the moon as an orientation cue. Uh, in the sky, you also have a polarization pattern that you've also heard of that forms in circles around the sun or around the moon. The difference between the sun and the moon is only that the full moon is a million times dimmer than a sun, and then it becomes set many times dimmer again as the moon becomes smaller and smaller. The theory behind how you orient using a polarization pattern is the same for night and day as long as you can actually, you are sensitive enough to pick up the light that is in the night sky. So if the sun or the moon moves in the sky, also this polarization pattern will move and when the sun or the moon is close to the horizon you have one single directional polarization stretching across the entire sky. 
And this is when it's the easiest for us to manipulate the polarization pattern, because now we only have one direction sort of to man manipulate. So if you imagine a beetle, just for simplicity, that wants to move parallel to this direction of polarization, but they can move at any angle to the polarization direction. But just for simplicity, let's assume it wants to move straight in relationship to the polarization pattern. We can now put a polarizing filter above these animals that will rotate the polarization pattern by 90 degrees. And as the beetle gets in under the filter, we expect it then to turn by 90 degrees to follow its compass. And as it gets out from underneath the filter again, it should then rotate back again by 90 degrees. But it could, at any of these turning points, actually it could just as well move left because this is a 180 degree compass cue that is only on, on an axis. And this is what that actually looks like in the field. So here comes the beetle. This is the speed they move at. This, this is me with the red lamp that the beetles can't see. The beetle goes under the polarizing filter, and I hope you can see it's turning. It comes out again underneath the open sky, and oof, it's again off course, according to its compass, and it moves again back towards its original bearing. This is still the only demonstration of an animal using the polarization pattern around the moon, but I am 100% sure there are many other animals that are able to do this. It's just very hard to demonstrate in many animals, like they have tried, for example, in, in, in locusts, but they are much more chaotic than a dung beetle in the way that they move about and jump and so on. Yes? Um, so does it ever turn left again when it moves out of the polarization? Uh, so once they're out here, they will always turn back to original direction again because there will also be an intensity gradient that will actually help them to get the compass right. But under the polarizing filters, they can randomly, you know, they will randomly go left or right. Yeah. Otherwise, that is kind of like a control for that your system is actually working, because that is what you would expect them to do. Yeah. Or you can also, that we need to do with some of the beetles, we will instead just put them under the polarizing filter, and uh, we will watch them roll out in their, um, along their straight bearing. And then, just to check that they are actually able to orient under these circumstances, we'll put them in again. They're so reliable, these animals. <laughs> and then we turn the filter by 90 degrees. And as you see, the animal is actually held in his hand during this rotation, and they, they, it, it doesn't disturb them. We have control for all of these things. And then it could now turn left or right. They do both under these circumstances, yeah. So, so it's, it's interesting because some of our species we can actually do the first method with, and with some of them we need to do the second method. And it's silly, but it took us actually 10 years to realize this difference when we were. So it's doing behavioral experiments always seems very simple when you present the end result on a screen like this, but it's the actual, um, actual uh, fiddling to actually go there that is the exciting thing with doing behavioral experiments from, from my perspective. Okay, so they can use polarized light on, around the moon and around the sun. You also have intensity gradients, which basically comes because it's brighter where the sun is compared to the other side of the sky where the sun is not, and that forms an intensity gradient, and that we can manipulate in the following way. We just created an artificial um, intensity gradient uh, with the use of uh, neutral density filters, and if we put this intensity gradient parallel to the one in the sky, then they would uh, keep to the same direction. And <coughs> What we do is that we measure sort of the exit bearings twice, like you've seen before, and if they keep the same direction on all these circular diagrams, they will then end up close to zero. So whenever you see that, it means that the beetle kept its direction, whereas when we rotated intensity gradient, they turned by close to 180 degrees. So they can also follow an intensity gradient, and then we move down to see if they can use a spectral gradient. This is kind of tricky to do in the field because it's difficult to, to, to actually 
build that spectral gradient that forms from greener where the sun is to richer in UV on the other side. So here we actually had to move inside and instead of just having a green light now in our sky arena, we also had a UV light um, on the other side. So we were kind of creating a spectral gradient using UV um, uh, LEDs, uh, with uh, the sun side being green and the anti-sun side being uh, richer in UV. And then we can build this arena. So this is, uh, we are sometimes working in a lodge, and this is in their games room. <laughs> So we build our indoor lab temporarily at these different field sites. Uh, and here we, there is a pool table full with our equipment and then we just set up our arena. So here would be the little sky room where the beetles are actually released and then it's controlled from over here. And when we get bored, we can always play pool in between. So it's... it's um, it's, it's, it take, it take, it's, it's, a, it's an interesting way of doing work because you can directly do the sorts of experiments where you take them from the field and directly into the lab without flying them from South Africa to Sweden and do the experiments only there. Yes? Do you have statistics on the response time uh, with respect to these changes of uh, cues? <coughs> I mean, for example, in the case in which you uh, reflect the polarized uh, light. Yeah. Do they respond in the same time as that they arrive at a certain point and then they turn left to right? Uh, oh, before, after they got the polarizing filter. Um, they, y yes, I mean, we can measure that this. It's, it's, all, it's all recorded, yeah. Uh, and it, it varies a bit between the different animals, but it's fairly constant, yeah. Okay. Also, do they need to... Uh, assume something about the stability of the compass. So for example, you, in your experiment, situa the situation is always stable. You have this polarization filter, or etc. But if you start rotating it slowly or faster, you can create a rotation spectrum at various speeds. So I guess at some point... We are going towards that towards the end of my talk. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> but that is, I think that is an experiment that needs to be done for the way we're now understanding the neuronal coding of these cues. So it's on its way, it hasn't been done yet, but it is, uh, it's being constructed for, because you can do it in this sorts of environment. You can, you can move the sun, for example, in any way you want. Yeah. Mm? I'm just curious how different the environment has to be for the beetle to choose a new direction. Because if they can go from outside to inside and they still keep the same ball, if you switch the ball to a new ball, will they know that, like smell it or something? And oh, okay, yeah, okay. They don't care if it's their ball or somebody else's ball. You can give them a golf ball. Mm -hmm. And they, as long as it smells of dung, they will accept anything. Most of the time, we actually take their real ball. We replace it with a clay ball invented by Lana, this latest version of a, of a, of a dung ball. Because then we actually know that they have the same form and the same shape for all of the beetles we are testing. So as long it's the process of making the ball that makes them reset their direction. What about the ones that steal balls? Yes, I know. Th this is a very, very good question. So are you asking if they steal it with the direction or if they... <laughs> if they <laughs> 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 that, that would be really interesting and, and something we have played with doing but actually haven't got around to properly look at, but I'm sure they don't steal it with the direction. But or, is it, or is it that they keep the direction from the previous ball that they made? Yeah, I, the short answer to that is we do not know because we haven't looked at that. But I, my guess would be that they keep the direction when they made a ball. Yeah. Yes? Are there some reasons that just follow on other people rolling a ball? I guess it's energetically smarter. Uh, yes, <laughs> yeah. No, and I fully agree, and they do that. They will, so one rolls away from the dung pile and another one is running and then they are fighting. Will, and it would now be very smart for the falling beetle, if it won, to now keep on rolling in this direction. I'm, you know, without having measured this, I'm almost 100% sure that is not the case, yeah. Beetles don't make clever decisions about where to roll their balls. They, they will roll into stuff over the dung pile or whatever. Yes? Yeah, I, it's not been tested, but I've seen that the, the dung beetle stealer will keep it the same direction as its previous one. Yeah, so, so it's the yeah. 
throw a ball and then it goes and steals someone else's in the direction of the creek. But I mean, this is a whole beautiful series of experiments <coughs> of theft that one can look at. We just haven't gotten around to doing it yet. Yes? Um, so I wonder whether they can um, code the relative angular difference, like if, it, if they have to do, perform some homing or retrieving task from one point to another goal location. Can they do that? If, sorry, I, if they, from, from homing, what did you say? Yeah, just like, can they um, code for the relative difference of uh, angular difference? Because now I just see like they, they keep a um, uh, direction relative to the color or the sound direction, but mm -hmm. can they like um, code for the angular difference from one position to another so that they can retrieve something from a goal location or going back to a goal? Oh, oh, okay. These, these beetles never ever go back to anything in their whole life, as far as I understand them. Uh, when they have fed on this dung ball, they will then come to the surface. And this is why they are a symbol of rebirth, by the way, if for the Egyptians, because they will come back from, from Earth again after having been buried. And once they do that, well, after they have consumed the dung ball, they will now fly off to a totally new location uh, again. So they never return. They don't have a home to go to. They don't go back to the same restaurant. They just go to a new one. Yeah. Hmm? I was a little confused by the gradient experiment mm. because that was during the day and then there should have been the sun present. Right? Like the, polar with like the sun as a... With the intensity mm -hmm. gradient. Yeah, exactly. Right? Yeah. So they don't they see the sun itself. That is shaded from view when we do ah, okay. those. So in every experiment, you present it, it, you exclude the other cues. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the sun. The sun is so. Even though they use all these cues, the day active beetles, as you will see, uh, always use the sun as the primary cue if it is there. So yes, for that experiments, we have to hide that from view. So you never see like because for the ants there are these intermediate directions they choose, right? If they have conflicting. So this is not something that that we You will s you will see that in an oncoming graph. Yeah. This is like the best audience in the world but <laughs> for asking questions, but a few of those things will happen in about 10 minutes from now, okay? Uh, so so we were talking about the spectral gradient that we find difficult to study outdoors and we instead do in the field and there we can actually show that they will use the green uh, light spot as the sun, whereas under certain circumstances they will now use the UV light as the, as the anti-sun direction. And I will go into more details of that experiment soon. So, so far we have shown that they are able to use all uh, of these cues that are also used by, for example, Cataglyphus ants. Uh, but also in the sky you have stars, as, as you have seen also this morning, and um, it, it was kind of theoretically predicted that these animals should not be able to use the stars because the stars are just too small and too dim for their small compound's eyes to actually see. So we kind of ignore that as a possible compass cue for, for a long time um, until we actually were proven wrong on, on, on that part. This is a photograph taken at our field station uh, in South Africa, and what you see here is, is the Milky Way that is very pronounced in the Southern Hemisphere. Pure, by kind of almost by luck, we managed to pick one of the least light polluted areas in the world for our experiments. So here the Milky Way is really, really pronounced and beautiful. And we have done experiments where we let the beetles roll under full moon conditions and then we track them and then we measure their paths as a measure of orientation performance. So a completely straight path here, the way we measured it, would be 120 centimeters long and on average they are 136. So this means that they go in almost completely straight lines under full moon conditions. This was not a surprise, this we kind of expected, but this was part of a study when we wanted to see what happened when the moon got smaller and smaller. 
And as a last thing, because that's happened to be how the moon cycle worked, we also wanted to show that when there were only stars in the sky, they were then eventually lost. We failed in doing this because many of these beetles were now actually well oriented. And this just caused some confusion because we had, some 10 years earlier, published that actually when there was no polarized light in the sky, our animals were completely lost. So now we found ourselves in the field, 10 years later, getting experiments that absolutely contradicted what we had published in a fairly good journal 10 years earlier. And that was not a fun experience. And you feel like, oh my god, shall we tell anyone? Shall we? Uh, well, you know, you soon realize, yes, for good practice, of course, you have to look at this. And this is also when you, when you do the most exciting discoveries. It's really when you get it totally opposite to what you expect will happen when you plan your experiments. So, we, we then decided we put caps on the beetles because maybe they were actually using something else. But it turned out that we actually, we think it should be in the sky because when we put the cap on them, they were again lost. So we then had to go back to Lund and then uh, we spent several months thinking how we should actually test this. And we decided then to build um, an arena where the beetles could see only the sky. And here you see Eric. Um, eagerly taking notes from this experiment. Uh, and the design here is, is, is actually, it's like a beetle roulette table because it's a round table, so up there, so to say. And then there's a hole in the middle of the table. The beetle goes up there with its ball, then it starts rolling, and then, as beetles do, it will do its best to roll straight. And then, if it rolls straight, it will fairly quickly fall down into one of these little pockets here. And yes, we did take bets where it would fall out. And then, if the beetle can't orient, instead, it will not move in a straight line, but it will move as the ones you saw with the caps, so it will move in circles. And then it takes a lot longer to reach the edge of this table. And all the beetles could see during this experiment was only the sky above them. We had to build this big wall because we were worried that maybe someone had lit a fire at the horizon while we were doing our experiments, or that there was some light pollution that they could be using. So, or that they were maybe seeing the little faint light from our cameras. So we decided not to film the beetles and not being able to see them so they couldn't use us, but only, only stars in the sky because we actually still believed that they couldn't use this. Uh, so, and then we timed the beetles, how long it took from when they started to roll until they fell out. This is a valid way of doing it because a beetle will roll at the same speed, irrespective of its pitch dark, if it's lost or if it actually has an orientation cue. <coughs> Which is surprising, I agree, because that is not what you would expect, but that is actually what the beetles do. And all we could see of this experiment was this, it was the beetle falling down with its ball into one of the pockets. And since these beetles are now actually, they fall down, they have now rolled inside this very artificial environment, they go on top of the ball and they are ready to roll again. So we could put the bee, same beetle in several times and get a very good measure of its performance. And this is what we saw. So under full moon conditions, when we know they can orient, it took them 20 seconds to go in and <coughs> and it fell out. Then we put caps on our beetles again, like a lost condition. It now took them two minutes before they would actually come out of this equipment. And then the fun started, of course. We, we had to wait a few nights until we had only stars in the sky. And then we saw that, as we had actually seen before, they were slightly less directed, but they were by no means lost. And then, of course, we needed the ideal condition, which would be... What would be the perfect control in this uh, condition? How would you best control that they were actually using the stars in the sky and nothing else? Overcast. overcast, exactly. We rarely get overcast because we don't go there when it's overcast, but we managed to get two nights when it was overcast, and yes, the beetles were lost again. So now we had no other explanation than that it was actually the stars that they were using. But to understand how they were using the stars, we drove back to Johannesburg and set up our equipment in the Johannesburg planetarium. 
The planetarium was fully booked at the time, but we were allowed to work there during the night. So then during the day, they had this little smell of good science uh, in their planetarium. And in the planetarium, we could now dictate the starry sky. We could, you know, have only the brightest stars, because if an animal is able to use any stars with their visual system, it should be one of the brightest stars. The animals were then lost. We tried with, with all 4,000 stars projected here and no Milky Way, and the animals were lost. But if we shown them only the Milky Way, they did perform as well as they did with all of the stars there. So they were using the Milky Way that is actually like a light streak across the sky rather than for their visual system, rather than lots and lots of individual stars. And this also explains why they had actually learned to navigate to the stars, so to say, in 10 years. Because this is what we got in 2010, and this is what we got in 2012. And the difference was, going back to uh, my lab books, was that we did experiments in October in 2002, but in February in 2012. So in a very, very fortunate way, we had actually made the perfect control, because in 2002 the Milky Way was not visible, because it was very close to the horizon, but in 2012 it ran across the zenith. So in a way we had actually removed the Milky Way from the starry sky, then they were not able to orient, but when they had the Milky Way they could orient. Yes? So, sorry that I asked it again, but you, you get the beetles in the field yeah. and you drive with them to Johannesburg and go to the planetarium and they orient. Yeah. But not, now they are not keeping the same direction. Because now they will be given new balls. So you give them thumbs so yeah. they can have yeah. the experience yeah. again? Okay. Yeah. And this is the same we do in the lab as well. They just the colony Yes. Yeah. So last two weeks ago, we brought back 300 beetles from South Africa. And then you give them dung and they will roll. Well, that's yeah. cool. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, I agree. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, they won't be jet lagged because it's only an hour difference as well in their, in their flight. Okay. So these animals are definitely also using the stars. Now what I had planned was to have, you know, some time for questions, which is completely unnecessary with this audience anyway, so we don't need to have this at all. But we had a question. Yes? Um, I was wondering whether these uh, beetles do path integration at all, because it seems to me that no matter the condition, they have planned to integrate with the beetles. Mm -hmm. Yes. So they can basically navigate based on non-microbes rather than doing path integration. Mm -hmm. uh, um, these these, these beetles, the ball rolling dung beetles, they won't path integrate because they, they have no reason to, because they, they, they don't have a goal. Uh, there, is, um, there is very closely related beetles that we are now working on and hoping, to, we have just finished that and hoping to publish next year. There are also path integrating dung beetles that will behave like any other path integrating animal but slightly worse. They're not very good at path integrating. But then in that case, you have to remove all the cues to study path integration, right? Uh, How do you do that? Because there are so many cues that they can use to orient themselves. But that is, how, why, that is part of them path integrating? Or were you thinking about just the distance? Or how do you? No, I'm just thinking about the distinction between landmark-based navigation and path integration. Oh, okay, yes. So when, when we study um, path integration in the path integrating beetles, not to be confused with what I'm telling you now, we, uh, we actually move them from, um, from their normal uh, grounds to somewhere else where we release them again, and then they can't use landmarks, and then we look only at the celestial compass. Oh, okay. yeah. Like you would do, you have done in, in desert ants before. Yeah. <coughs> Yes? In the planetarium, can you rotate the Milky Way and have you? Uh, yes, you can. No, we haven't. Because that, that, actually, that planetarium is from the 1940s. So, <laughs> so it takes a very long time. But since we are now moving into this, I will show you we have done it, but not in that planetarium. Okay, so in five minutes from now, you will have your answer to that. Okay? 
Um, so understanding that these animals use the stars, uh, we, we still want to understand how we know they use the Milky Way, but what is the actual mechanism be be behind their star orientation. And of course then you look at how other animals are using stars for orientation. We know that birds can use stars. Uh, seals have also been shown to do it. Now the beetles, maybe frogs and moths can also do the same thing. There are suggestions that they can do this. Uh, birds do not use the time compensated <coughs> star compass, as we have learned, uh, but they, what they will do is that they will learn the rotational center of the starry sky, and that is how they, use, uh, they find north uh, using the stars. Whereas seals will rather orient to a few bright stars, so they use them as a, as a load star. They will swim towards stars, and as they set below the horizon, they will pick a new star and orient to that. That is also how humans are using, um, the Polynesians use stars to orient by. This, of course, requires that you can see the individual stars, and we don't think the beetles can do that. Uh, pinpointing the rotational north, well, yeah, that might be difficult if you don't actually see the stars rotating, but yeah, maybe they could do that. But what we... Okay, that means yeah. the rotation north really requires integration over a long time. So if you're yeah. flying over the entire night as a bird, I mean, you need to integrate over several hours to get that. So yeah. this happens within seconds yeah. or minutes, yeah. so it wouldn't work. No. No, and that is not what they do either, as you will see. So what we did to answer this was we had to build our own planetarium where we could quickly swap the Milky Way's direction. And this has been done by uh, one of my postdocs, James Foster. And he built his own planetarium in the field because even though we can move the beetles to Lund, for example, we get the best results and the fastest results if we can do this with freshly caught animals. So he has basically built a dome and then all these plates that you see will be carrying uh, LEDs that will simulate uh, the stars. And then they need a surface to roll on, a tent to block out all the lights from outside, a lot of wiring <laughs> and a sweaty James. And then this is what we have in the end. We have two Milky Ways that we can let the beetles orient under. And we can now within, you know, instantly switch from one direction to the other and see if they follow that change in the setup. And now we can test, for example, of course you need to do the, the boring control with no lights, and yes, they are lost under these conditions. If we show them a Milky Way that is the same intensity all across the Milky Way, the beetles are actually lost. They cannot use that at all, they will pick new directions whenever we put them in the center again. Then the Milky Way is not the same intensity across the whole band, and we thought that maybe they could orient to the difference in intensity in this band, and that is what we have simulated here. You see, for example, that there is a 45 degree star on that side, but not on the other side and the difference here is higher than on the other side. No, they cannot orient under these circumstances. But as you see, there are also always the same number of lamps or the same number of stars on each side of this hemisphere. And that is probably what is confusing to them because as soon as oops, we give them um, a difference in contrast between the right side and the left side, they are perfectly able to orient. Yes? Are you doing those experiments in February? Or like is, it, is there a time component that you know this is the season where I use the Milky Way? Yeah, no, that, that doesn't seem to matter. We have done them both in, uh, in November and February. Yeah. <coughs> it's just that those experiments, it was <coughs> actually not available to them. They couldn't see the Milky Way in October. So it was impossible to use it. <coughs> so we see that there needs to be a contrast difference between the two sides of the Milky Way for them to be able to do that. So effectively there is a brighter side and a darker side, and that is what they seem to orient to. So there needs to be a contrast of 13% between the two sides of the Milky Way for them to be able to use it. And of course the question is, we did this in an artificial environment, is there a contrast difference of 13% in the real Milky Way? 
Well, this we have looked at by taking, um, if it was slightly darker here, you could actually see James here with his, uh, <coughs> with his camera. So what we do is we take images of the sky, then we can reconstruct them from uh, the resolution of the beetle, and then we can look at what the, uh, what this, what the intensity distribution is along the Milky Way. And there is definitely more than 13% uh, contrast for them. Yes? So I'm just wondering about the previous slide, your, your panel H where there was 0% contrast. So the, the beetles can so they, their field of view, they can see both sides when they're looking. They can, so they've got quite a, a wide... Yes, view yes, point. yeah. Mm. Yeah, they have a wide visual field that covers a large part of the sky. Mm. Yeah. Yes? <coughs> you know, I understand you correct that if you have just one line mm -hmm. of light, mm -hmm. they are unable to use yes. this extremely yeah. prominent view yeah. to mm -hmm. keep a straight line, and they can use everything else to keep a straight line. Mm -hmm. It's very, very, it was very surprising for us as well. We, would thought, we were sure they would be able to do that. They cannot. No. I mean, they can, they, can, uh, they can push in a straight line. When we put them down again, they can't hold that direction. Maybe it's the 180 degree ambiguity there. No, 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 it doesn't come out of that. It, they are, it's totally random. Because <coughs> that would also be, I mean, a good guess, but no. What if, what if you make half of one and half of the other, like uh, a 90 degree... Uh, oh, like, like that? Yeah, both at the same time? Uh, we haven't done that, so I, I don't know. I think they would be able to do that, because then you would create one half of the sky that is brighter, than the other half of the sky. But if they would not, that would be interesting because that yeah. would, it suggests that they have an expectation of the shape. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Can easily do it, haven't done it, but that can be tested, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and comparing, using this strategy is actually, even if you have a much worse visual system than <coughs> the Beatles, and actually really don't see a lot at all, maybe like, um, I don't know, a clam or something, then it would actually still be brighter in one part of the Milky Way than the other. So this is a very, very uh, robust orientation system. But comparing one side in intensity with the other side is, as you see, a less precise orientation cue. So if they use the sun or the moon, that is just a point source, they will have a more precise orientation system than when they're using the stars, where the orientation error is almost twice as large. So it will still support their exit from the dung pile, but not as efficiently as the sun or the moon. <coughs> okay, so as, as also I've been mentioned several times this morning, so the beetles have a large range of cues that they can use to orient by. And for them to be able to switch between these cues, which is, for example, even if they use the sun as the primary cue when orienting, if they roll under a big tree, for example, the sun will suddenly be gone from their visual system for that part of their travels, and they might then, for example, instead follow the polarization pattern. They will still need to know how these two cues are actually related to each other for them to make sense together. And for example, bees and ants, they, act, they, they kind of have an, an inborn understanding of the sun in relationship to the polarization pattern. The beetles do not. They will accept any strange combination of polarized light and, and a sun or a moon. Uh, and, um, and they need to then form a relationship between all of these different cues we present to them. And when do they do this? Well. If you might have seen this uh, <coughs> during the films before, but before the beetle takes off with its ball, it has finished its ball, it then goes on top of its dung ball and makes this rotational movement on top of the ball. And as you see, it will hold its head out and it's actually leveling it to the horizon. And it then gets a rotational reading of the sky. And this is when they form the relationship between the different cues that are available to their compass. And I would now try to explain this experiment. I've tried to explain this several times, and I always find when I get to half of it, people look like this. So just stop me, because I'm doing my absolute best here to, to, you know, to um, tell you the elegance of this experiment here. Just a question. Yeah. How much time do they need to do this rotation? 
how much time they need yeah. to do it. Uh, it is frustratingly uh, different. Yeah. So of course we try to you know characterize this dance and describe it. It varies so much that it's it's really um, it difficult to say that. Yeah. Okay. But in this setup now, we are now in our Skylab, where we'll show them green light and UV light, which is two cues that you need to put in relationship to each other. It could just as well have been the sun and the polarization pattern, that doesn't matter. We will here now just do it with the green and the UV for the concept of what they're doing. So what we can do here is that we'll show them the green and the UV light, 180 degrees to each other, while the beetle is dancing. Okay, so this is when we think they put the relationship between these two, that green is here and UV is there. So if the green suddenly disappears, I still know how to continue to orient using the UV light. Then, as the beetle starts to roll, we can then choose to turn one cue off or keep both cues uh, running. So this is basically what we do in this experiment, and this is what this symbol here shows. Here they see green and UV when dancing, and then we turned off and only show them green when they continue to roll. Then we take the animal, we put it back in the center again, and then we can then, for example, choose to show them only UV for that entire roll. And then we measure the change of direction between the two rolls, and that is what we plot here. So if the dots are all around zero degrees, means that they were able to keep their direction between these two rolls. Okay? You still look like you are with me on this one. Um, <clears throat> so these are four conditions we have done this under. Here they see the two lights dancing and rolling. We put them in again. We only give them the UV light. They're fine with that. They understand what the UVQ is telling their compass, and they will continue to roll in the same direction. Then we show them only green for the first roll. We put them in again, show them only UV, 180 degrees to the green light. They know change by 180 degrees. To them, it's just going by the brightest intensity in the world. They have never seen the green and the UV together, so they go by the brightest light. Here the green was the brightest, then the UV was the brightest, 180 degrees to that. So they changed by 180 degrees. Okay, here we show them both cues when dancing, only one when rolling, and then only the green when rolling, and then we show them the UV light. So the difference between that experiment and this is that they saw both when dancing. And they know keep the direction, so they understand what the UV light is telling them in relationship to the green. And then we show them only <coughs> green when dancing, both when they are rolling, and then only UV light. And now they change by 180 degrees. So they behave as these ones that don't understand the relationship between the two cues. So only when they see the two cues when dancing is when they get the relationship. So the dance is when they formulate the relationship between the different cues. When they form the relationship between polarized light, the sun, between different spectral cues. And we can really show it to them in all non-sensible combinations, and they will accept that as part of their compass. Questions on that? Yes? Why are you going 180 degrees when you, plan for, uh, when you show them the UV light? I mean, you could expect to hold a random orientation. Yes. So imagine they get the green light. Let's say they move away from that light. So they now use that as the brightest point, and that is what they orient to. We put them in again. We show them UV light here. They still want to orient in a straight line. But that's on the sky, it should be on the opposite side. Right? Yes, but they don't have a concept of that. They formulate the concept of how these cues relate to each other during the dance. And they didn't see them together during the dance. So now they take, okay, now here is the brightest spot, and I was moving away from that, so now I'm going in this direction. And we measure that as a 180-degree change. But then I'm surprised about the, 
the Milky Way results, because there, uh, as Henry pointed out, uh, you basically have a very bright cue that you could use. Mm -hmm. And if you are like, updating your, your environment with information while, while you're dancing, then they should be able to use the they should, unless they compare the two sides with each other that are now identical under those circumstances. So then it is the 180 and ambiguity that makes that cue not useful. Yeah, but when we measure their performance under these cues, they don't change by 180 degrees. They go in all random directions. Yes? So in the previous experiment, you basically, if you look from the semantics, like they're doing one of these um, dances at every beginning of the journey. Yeah. yeah. But so the first one would be somehow special because that yes. one, yeah, so I mean, because there are two things happening at the very first one, right? It's learning the relationship to cues, or I mean, I don't know, I'm just guessing. Yeah. At which point does the Dan Beetle pick the orientation that it also wants to keep relative to the I also want to know that. Okay, so this is not clear. No, this is not clear. I mean, it's because we have tried, believe me, I, I, will, I will show you, I mean, we have tried everything to try to influence the direction they take. We have, we have blocked off like everything apart from 30 degrees. It's like a big wall here. And you think, okay, now we will actually influence the beetles to mostly go here where they can actually leave. No. They go in all different directions. We have put beetles on one side, thinking that is the biggest threat to them. They were actually tied down to the board. The beetles roll over them. They, there is nothing in their environment that seems to influence where they go. So it, it's, it's, it's frustratingly random what we are looking at. Yes? Did you look at the, the direction when they approach towards the dunk? Like because they come from all the different sides? Yeah, yeah, doesn't matter. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yes? Those, uh, those I mean, the experiment, the, the result of this exp experiment would also mean, right, that it's only the first dance that's determining the direction and all following dances are only to find out where the cues are, right? Yes, that is how we have not been able to show that, but as, yes, as, as you might not all have seen, but as Henrik says, they will also dance every now and then when they are rolling. So they dance in the beginning, then they roll, and when they sort of, if they lose contact with the ball, if they fall over, if we stop the ball, they will dance again, and then they continue to roll. So th there are two, um, two different meanings of the dance. One is probably because you get a very stable wreathing on top of the ball. So we think that is what they're doing. We still haven't been able to convincingly show that that is what they do. And, and what's the timing? How long do they keep that first time? Like, how, how long time do you have to drive them to the planetarium or whatever, or, or to, or to uh, the okay. next setup? They will pick a new direction in the planetarium. Okay, yeah. but, but in your experiments in general, you say you can put them under a time bag yeah. and they will do the same thing. How long time did that take, the 100 rolls, would you say, Lana? Uh, like an hour? Yeah. And it's as long as they haven't put it in the ground, they'll keep that. Yeah. Basically. And I think they would go for a hundred more. <laughs> yeah, we gave up. We thought this is... <laughs> yeah. the, the test was really to see how long they would do it, but after a hundred we thought this is, this is silly, because we want to repeat it in several animals. Yeah. Yes? So, with... I don't know, Hendrik was talking about these two different types of dance, where there's the initial one and later, mm -hmm. but have you tested that? Do they recalibrate this, so if you do the same beetle over and over using different of these protocols, mm -hmm. do they always kind of agree with this, these results? Like, as in, are they recalibrating this, like... You mean if I change all the, if I change the relationship? So if you, like, take one beetle and do the first, um, the first protocol on the top left, and yeah. then you immediately take it again and do the second, and then immediately take it again and do the first again, and immediately take it again. <coughs> Do fourth or something like that. I are think we would be as confused. No, we. we um, <laughs> you see um, what I mean? Like, are they are they recalibrating this relationship between the cues yeah. every single time they do the dance? Um, because that wouldn't be hard to test if you just repeated it over and over on a single beat. Uh, 
uh, I'm thinking that they would then we would then let them roll half ways, and then we would then we would stop them, and and then they would dance, and in the meantime we would have swapped the relationship around. Um, no, we haven't done that. No. Mm -hmm. So it isn't fair to say in some way that for the Beatles, it's all the same. The Milky Way, the intensity gradient, the whatever else they're yeah. using, because it's always this intensity gradient. And even, even with the polarized light, you have some intensity gradient. Yeah, I mean, these, these ones are set to the same uh, photon flux. So, yeah. But it, I, I would say that all, all um, cues are sort of the same to them. It doesn't matter. They take what is there. We call that, we say that they take a celestial snapshot because it's really not, they can accept any relationship. And this is probably also now on the last field trip, we actually rolled the beetles in, in Johannesburg because I was curious to see how they would cope with this really strange environment that I expected would upset the compass. They were perfectly fine. And I think it's because they actually now just snapshot whatever is around them to orient by. Yeah? So one more question about uh, this memory thing. I mean, they seem to form some kind of memory of the like, position in which direction they want mm -hmm. to go, right? And so it seems like it's, it's sort of surprising to me how quickly they seem to form it and then how long-lasting it is. So is there something that you could do, for example, to test whether part of the consolidation happens in the first rolling phase where you, you know, you let them do that dance, they pick something. I wonder, because if they're successful at rolling, they'll see the same, you know, constellation mm -hmm. for a while. And I wonder if that's necessary to consolidate. So, so it's, because here, let's see, with how here, for example, it, it has changed while they were rolling. Yeah. So they only got to see that during the dance. Uh, but that, that was, I mean, they, they still did fine with not having the cues there while rolling. But one state and then they could like, maintain, because they have to memorize the relationship, but they also have to memorize the direction they want to take. Yes. Relative to at least, I mean, and maybe in these situations they always have at least one cue present, so maybe that's sufficient to like consolidate the mm, relative yeah, that yeah. you want to keep. But I wonder... It, you, one could let them roll for longer, for example, and see if the position is higher or something like that. Yeah, they basically vary how long they are exposed to that fixed heading, whether this has any effect on how well they can keep it. Because to me it seems very surprising, this, like, after, like, I don't know how variable it is, but the dance is very it's short. It's very short, yeah. So. Yes, Stanley? So what could you do in between the two parts of the experiment? Could you cool down the beetle? Could you anesthetize it with CO2? Could you do anything to it that actually disrupts the memory? Could maybe form some kind of idea about what the memory is? Is it, yeah. is it some kind of more long-term change? This, 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 this we could do. And what we have tried is we actually put the, the beetles in prison for a while. So we, we let them roll out and then we, we actually let them sit in the dark for a long time and then we put them in again to see if they would actually hold the memory and over what time. That we, it, it was not really, really conclusive and some of them could sit like that for two hours and, and hold the direction and, and, and for some that was not the case. So it's not something we have pursued for long but we can keep them yeah, somewhere and then put them out again and see how long the memory is. But we have no conclusive results on that. Yes? I have a question about the, uh, uh, so sometimes there are trees overhead. Mm -hmm. Imagine this could be another kind of a cube. You have some stars here, and then you have a pitch dot here. So you have a kind of a line of a, uh, you know, a yeah. jump in the intensity. Have you tried testing that? Uh, we kind of try to simulate that a bit in, in our artificial planetarium with these gaps. Uh, but also, we, we sometimes have overhead structures and we have looked at the effect of those and they seem to ignore that altogether. But then, then it's confusing because to me, if I understand correctly, what you say is that they can learn arbitrary association between cues because the, you know, the moon and the polarization pattern, the relation there is not arbitrary at all. It's no. actually very yeah. predictable mm -hmm. and same with the sun polarization. Yeah. So that for me, I'm just trying to think ecologically outdoors, the only arbitrary case is of a tree as opposed to this celestial mm. tree, because that's indeed arbitrary. Where are you under the tree's arbitrary? But then, if that doesn't affect them, then why would they do this arbitrary? 
instead of having it as a fixed one, right? The moon and the polarization pattern is completely predictable. Mm -hmm. So I'm kind of confused on that. Mm -hmm. Maybe I mean this maybe is just much easier to process than if you have some sort. But one could also think maybe it's easier to actually know what what these cues means in relationship to each other. Yeah, yeah. But this is a different method. And, and I think it works in their favor under some circumstances, like artificial circumstances, for example. But of course, it hasn't evolved to meet that. That is way too new. No. Yes? This dance on the dance ball, uh, it's circular turning, right? Mm -hmm. How many circles, how many times they turn around? Varied. Varied. And the, <coughs> Sorry? And the spin? Uh, also varied. There is nothing that is not varied in this dance. <laughs> We have, we, are, you know, we have tried to give them two suns and thinking they would now dance more, but now understanding that they maybe don't have a concept of how many suns there should be, this doesn't confuse them. I think actually we'll leave the questions there because we're running out of time. So save up your questions until the discussion, the round table discussion. Yeah, sorry about that. I realise it's a very interesting. Okay, now you have to choose. <laughs> Do you want to know how the compass is sensitive enough to see these really dim cues, or do you want to see how the neural system supports this? Okay, neuronal system, raise your hands. Yeah, that was my guess. Okay, <laughs> so we will, we will now uh, skip. Uh, okay, let me make the story very short. Is everybody going skiing? Sorry. I started a bit later, to be fair, but yeah. Okay, but okay, I can go back to that if we have time. But the short story is, if you have bigger eyes and bigger randoms, you can collect much more light. And that is what nocturnal beetles do. Okay, those were a few slides in a very quick, um, quick conclusion. Yeah? Okay, okay. So, now we go to the brain because I very quickly explained how the compass is actually able to, uh, to see these cues. Um, the beetles, as all other insects, of course, have a brain. Uh, and uh, <coughs> it looks like this. And then, of course, it contains of all different um, uh, sections as other insect brains. It's not so that the beetle brain is special in, in any way. It just looks a bit different when you look at it like this, because many of the beetles have four eyes. So they will have four optic lobes instead of two. That is the biggest difference um, from if, you, if you look at similar structures in other animals. Um, the, little, the little structure here that is called the central complex is the compass center of the beetle, and so it is of other insects that we know of. But Vivek and Stanley will be going through this in great detail. So for now on, let me just say that the beetle is no different from the stories that they will be telling, as far as we know. And if you want to look at tonight, and you can't wait for them to tell you about this, then you can go into the insect brain database, where uh, the brain of the beetle can be um, rotated in all sorts of directions. And this is a database that Stanley has started and you might hear more about. Uh, yeah, so if you need some uh, evening fun, that is what you can do. <laughs> uh, so how do we study the, the neuronal system of the beetles then? Well, as many other uh, people, of course, we, uh, we look at, um, we do uh, intercellular and extracellular recordings of, of the neurons. Uh, and when I say we, it, it's Basil Yundi that was a postdoc in my group and is now a group leader in Germany. And what maybe is a bit different from what we are able to do is that we can test the stimuli we are presenting to the beetles in the electrophysiological setup and actually show that this is what the beetles would orient to naturally. It's like when we move them from the sun to the green LED, these are the green LEDs that will be shown out here. Uh, we know that this is actually a cue that they will be naturally orienting to. And then we, we try to make a very close connection between the behavioral studies and the electrophysiological studies. So what I now wasn't really able to show you, but I will now have to tell you instead, because we skipped that part, is that if you take a day-active animal, you mirror the sun, as you have seen, 
the beetles will change their direction in response to the mirrored sun. This means that the animals are using the sun as their primary cue for orientation. And that is what uh, is shown here, that an orienting beetle will use the sun as their primary cue. If you do the same thing at night with the moon, most of the beetles will not turn in response to this. Some of them will, but the absolute majority will continue to roll in a straight direction. This is because at night, the animals, the nocturnal animals, will use the polarization pattern as their main cue. This is just a difference in the hierarchy in the different systems, depending on if they're orienting at day or at night. So again, the hierarchy and the compass system is different depending on the visual context under which the animal is orienting. As Eric pointed out as the very, very last thing in his talk, it's very important to look at the context of your animals that are orienting. Because here, actually, the systems are different. Here is the sun, that is the primary cue. During the night, it's the polarization pattern. <coughs> and this is what that looks like. And now you can also get kind of an answer to if there are intermediate responses. So during the day, they will change by 180 degrees when we mirror the sun. If we do the same thing during night, these are the yellow dots here, um, they will not change the direction when we mirror the moon. So that is the behavioral uh, part of that. Now we can go in and we can measure from the neurons in the central complex that are sensitive to polarized light and to a single light source. And we will see, measuring from the same neurons, that the ones um, uh, during the day and the daylight intensities will respond preferentially to the direction of the sun, whereas the one at night will respond preferentially to the direction of polarization. So they are here actually being shown both of these cues, but they will respond to the sun, the light source, single light source during the day, and the polarization pattern during the night. Now, if we take the, the day active beetles and put them under night conditions, this will still last. They will respond behaviorally to the moon, and their, um, uh, their neurons will also respond uh, preferentially to the moon. But the nocturnal animals will change the hierarchy in their compass system and now rather stare by the sun. So again, this just points out how important it is to look at our compass systems under the full visual ecology of the animals, because the systems will change depending on the visual context, and also, as you will hear about the central complex, also depending on the behavior of the animal, what it's actually doing. When you're saying uh, the animals act as night versus the day, it's the same species, right? These are different species. It is different species. Yeah. Mm. yeah, yeah, that got lost in the part that was gone. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So to fully be able to understand what our animals are doing, we are now moving into doing extracellular um, multi-channel recordings. Um, and it, by doing this, as many of you do, I've heard that already, you can actually listen or, or study several different neurons at the same time and see how they are changing depending on what you show to the animal. And my goal within the next uh, couple of years is hopefully to have a beetle orienting outside under the African sun or moon at the same time as we're able to record from its compass neurons. And we think this is possible because we have such a reliable orientation behavior, and the beetles are big enough to <coughs> carry these head stages where you can store this information on. But of course, it's, uh, it's a long way to go there, but we are on the first step by actually being able to obtain these recordings. So, so this is uh, where we are aiming in the future. Uh, yeah, this is my favorite dung beetle joke here. But um, <laughs> there are tons of them. It's very easy to throw this into a dung beetle at all. Um, so just because I have another four or five minutes, um, of course there will be... The, so 
One could say these beetles are very, very celestially focused. They don't use landmarks or, or anything else that we, we have seen. But of course, then you will have a problem when the sun is very high in the sky. Because when it's really high in the sky, it carries no compass information at all. It, it, I mean, it can't point you in any direction. And now we have actually realized that that is the point when the beetles will use wind orientation. Under all other circumstances, they fully ignore the direction of wind. But when the sun is high in the sky, we can now show them, we, we actually give them artificial wind here. And when we change that to 180 degrees, they don't react when the sun is low, medium. But when it's above 75 degrees in the sky, they will respond to the wind direction. So this is the backup that they have. And the wind is sort of like, if you average the wind direction, um, where they're active, it will be over a, a certain direction. And you have to remember that these animals, they only roll for a few minutes, maybe sometimes up to 10 or 15 minutes. Things don't change a lot during that time course. That is why they don't need to time compensate for the sun, for example. And the wind will be fairly reliable. And this is what uh, Adrian Bell, another postdoc, is currently looking at. Uh, so we can use add the wind to their uh, to their uh, compass uh, repertoire as well. Okay, now for the last three minutes, I'm, I'm just going to give you a little science quiz here on what you not, not actually what not what you have heard even. You just have to guess, but you seem to be very good at that. So, what compass cue, the sun or polarized light, do you think forest living beetles use as their primary cue? Everyone that thinks sun. Raise their hand. Oh, you. Oh, some words for the sun. Okay, and polarized light. Yeah. This is what Lana also thinks. This is just a preliminary uh, study, but it seems like they will not, even if we take them out into the fully open sky, they will actually not follow the sun itself, which makes sense because it is not, as you also pointed out, it is often hidden behind the trees. Did she survive <coughs> five minutes after that picture? <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> well is that <laughs> it is not photoshopped actually. It is, um, yeah, you will see who, who this is. This is actually, if you ever drink um, uh, Amarula, the African, South African liqueur, this is the elephant making the ads for Amarula. So it's semi tame. Not fully time. <laughs> okay. Do you use that one as your dunk sword? <laughs> yeah, I do, I do as well. Uh, okay. There are dung beetles that can move straight without the use of a compass. Is this true or false? Ooh, this one is tricky. Okay. Who thinks this is true? <coughs> oh, false. Now you're all wrong. <laughs> okay. There are dung beetles that can move straight without a compass. These are the female dung beetles. Uh, because this is a mating pair. Uh, and then it's the male beetle that does all the navigation. And she just sits there and <laughs> moves in a straight line. But you know, for all honesty, they then mate and then they make little balls and then she lays the eggs. And then she actually stays with the brood and takes care of it until it hatches. Okay. Beetles orient to terrestrial cues, meaning because when they dance, it's very easy to think that they actually check out their surroundings. True or false? False. False. Okay, who thinks false? Yeah, now you're getting a bit insecure but based on the last question there, yeah? This is definitely false. They don't orient to terrestrial cues, and we have tested that with even the biggest test terrestrial cues you could imagine. Because we thought that, okay, of all the things we have tried, maybe they would actually avoid rolling into the dung suppliers because they would walk on them. They do not. They happily roll into the elephant. Uh, and it turns out that the elephant is actually really afraid of beetles. So the elephant <laughs> ran away when that happened. <laughs> <coughs> <laughs> no, he did not run. <laughs> uh, that was the scary bit. That would have been fine. Yeah. 
And, okay, and how is the position of the compass influenced by the size of the navigator? That is not a yes or no question, but the answer can be found at Lana's poster. Uh, so, these are all the people that uh, has helped with this work, among them Eric Warrant, that is here, uh, and Lana. And uh, apart from that, thank you all for your wonderful suggestions and questions. And I'm, I'm happy to hear what you think about this being the animal with the most <laughs> you know, visual cues for their compass and other things and other thoughts, because you have brilliant thoughts and I will have to take note of them all before I have lunch. So thank you so much. Thank you.